Here's a preview of what you'll hear on this episode of Beyond the Wheel. Now, imagine trying to dump something like trying to pour a bucket of water into one of those dump stations. You know, it has the flap lid that kind of comes down over it. You can't do it, right? Either your foot's going to get wet because you got to have a foot holding the thing down, right? So you couldn't dump a cassette in there, really, unless you were just super gross about it. But by using the Americanizer and standard dump accessories, you can now dump any place regular RVs can dump. Now enjoy the show. You are listening to Beyond the Wheel, a podcast about the people and ideas that drive the RV community forward. Looking to get out there and stay out there? Battleborn Batteries Lithium Ion Batteries are here to power your RV, marine, and off grid adventures. Designed as an easy drop-in replacement for traditional lead-acid batteries, these reliable solutions have two to three times the power, charge five times faster, are a fifth of the weight, and last ten times longer. Offered in a variety of models in unique sizes and shapes, ranging from 50 amp hour to a robust 270 amp hour, and backed by a 10-year warranty. Battleborn batteries are built to fit your needs and power your experiences. On the road, on the water, and off the grid, reliable power is here. Check them out at BattlebornBatteries.com. Today's guest is part rocket scientist, part IT professional, part entrepreneur, and part RVer. That's right, we're talking with James from the Fit RV. James is here to talk about his invention, the Americanizer, which makes dumping a cassette toilet a little easier at a campground. So let's hear all about it. Hey, James, thanks for joining us today and welcome to the show. But before we get way into this interview, could you just tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, Yeah, James from Fit RV. Um, We are, I guess you'd call us RV industry influencers. Um, We have a blog, YouTube channel, yada, yada, yada. But our YouTube channel has been going for like probably 12 or so years now. So we're sort of OG RV influencers, like back when we started doing it, not everybody was doing it. And so we were kind of unique. Uh, Steph and I have been doing this for almost as long as we've been RVing. So we've had uh, three different RVs, two class B vans, and then our latest is a small class C. I have an engineering background. I guess that'll be evident as I guess as we get further into this, but I have an engineering background. Um, my first job out of college was actually like uh calculating missile trajectories for Department of Defense projects and stuff. Mm. So I I get to use that line, you know, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to understand this, but I'm a rocket scientist and I still don't (laughs) understand, you know. And yeah, that's that's kind of it. I've I've since left doing rocket science for (laughs) for a job, but I still have a day job. So I I work in IT by day and I'm an RV influencer by afternoon. Mm. That's kind of me. James, are you able to travel in the RV and work or or do you plan yeah. RV trips around your work? Okay, so you can work on so, the road. Yeah, yeah, I, I do travel and work from the road. And that actually used to be a big consideration in planning our RV trips. We would, you know, like Monday through Friday, we'd have to plan to be sort of in more or less civilized areas, you know, and then we could kind of head out into the boonies on the weekends kind of a thing, just because I had to be kind of available. Since we've started using Starlink, that's less of a consideration. We're we're out west, mm-hmm. so we don't have a lot of tree issues or anything like that. Pretty much everywhere we go, it it works. Unless we start getting into like you know the Pacific Northwest, I guess it might have some trouble up in the mountains there. But so yeah, I do work from the road. And we have you on today to talk about your Americanizer product. Is this something that you are also able to work on from the road, or does this take maybe a a more considerable amount of time that you have to be home for? Actually, right now, it doesn't take that much time at all. And we've we've structured things so that, and that's actually a big part of like our distribution model and whatnot is because we're RVers, we want to travel. And if we're on like a two month RV trip, I don't know of anybody that's going to want to wait two months for me to get home to, to ship them a sewage adapter. So, you know, that's a, that's a big part of it, but yeah, we've got I've, we've got that narrowed down to where that the active part of of working the Americanizer product is is pretty minimal 
now. Back when we first got started, it was considerably more, but now it's kind of, we're steady state. It, it's okay. So what what is the Americanizer, James? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, it is a sewage adapter for cassette toilets. Basically, it takes the uh, the output the output that's a nice <laughs> um, the, the output of a cassette is that, toilet. Is that the engineering word for it? The <laughs> I think the engineering word would be effluent. Um, <laughs> it takes the the effluent out of a cassette toilet because a cassette toilet, and maybe we should back up and kind of kind of cover up what, what is a cassette toilet for those who who maybe don't know. So. Cassette toilets, it's they're the standard, the absolute standard for how RV toilets are done in Europe. We've RV'd in Europe a little bit, and literally 100% of all the RVs in Europe have cassette toilets. So imagine your typical RV black tank, and then you now shrink that down to where it's just five gallons, okay? And then make that removable in sort of a watertight box and put wheels on it so that you can kind of tote it around and dump it anywhere and that's a cassette toilet so it's like a very small removable black tank Mm -hmm. now over here obviously that's not sort of the standard but they are finding a market in rvs that a are smaller you know or b since there's no black tank that's outside you know if you want to make like a winter ready rv with a cassette toilet that little five gallon box is pretty easy to get in a space inside the rv so it stays warm like off-grid overlander type uh, type RVs, you know, truck campers, those kinds of things, they're they're pretty big into the cassette toilets because it's smaller and it's you know, if you're out in the middle of nowhere, you might be able to find like a pit toilet or a vault toilet or something like that, and you can dump it into those, or even a regular toilet like at a interstate rest area or something like that. You can dump the cassette toilet into those kinds of things. You don't necessarily have to find an RV dump station. So that's that's kind of the cassette toilet. Now, dumping in that way, the cassette toilet sort of just has like a, a spout with a little knob that you twist on like a pour spout, which is okay for dumping into a toilet or a pit toilet, or especially if you're in Europe, you know, where they've got the the... RV dumps in Europe for the cassette toilets, imagine like a sink, like a big stainless steel sink that that is one square yard, okay? And then you just kind of, you don't even care. You don't have to aim. You don't have to try. You don't care if it splashes, whatever. You know, it's a a yard, a a cubic or square yard, you know, to dump it into. It's no big deal, right? But here, the typical American RV dump is a little three-inch hole in the ground. Well, the cassette toilets are great as they are for dumping into pit toilets, outhouses, porta potties, home toilets, what have you. For a lot of folks, myself included, aiming a gusher of poo water <laughs> to a little three inch hole in the ground, you know, that, that's a recipe for needing a new pair of shoes, right? So that's what the Americanizer does it takes the, the output of the cassette toilet. There's that output word again. It takes the output of the cassette toilet and basically it adapts it to fit into the standard North American RV sewer accessories that everyone knows and is familiar with. So the hoses with the bayonet fittings, whatever. It takes just what would be a nasty spout of free-flowing sewage and puts it into your sewer hose so that you can dump it in a normal... In a, and now imagine trying to dump something like trying to pour a bucket of water into one of those dump stations, you know, it has the flap lid that kind of comes down over it. You can't do it, right? You, you, either your foot's going to get wet because you got to have a foot holding the thing down, right? So you couldn't dump a cassette in there, really, unless you were just super gross about it. But by using the Americanizer and, and standard dump accessories, you can now dump any place regular RVs can dump. Most RVs that are made by like major manufacturers that are RVA, RVIA, certified RVs, they also have a gray tank. And you're going to be empty in that gray tank anyway, and that's going to have a three-inch opening and use all the dump accessories. And so for most folks, they're not having to bring along like a hose that they didn't have to bring along before. That's one reason a lot of people like the cassette toilet is because they don't have to deal with a sewer hose. If you're doing like a self-build or some sort of boutique custom RV build, maybe you only have a gray tank and you put in just like a garden hose connection or something to drain your gray water, right? That might be okay. 
But for anything that's coming from a, a major manufacturer, you know, Winnebago, Thor, Forest River, whoever, right, it's probably going to have a three inch opening and you're going to need a dump hose anyway. So for a majority of, of mainstream RVers, it's not taking, you're not needing anything extra. So that's, and the name, I should get into the, the name, I guess. The name Americanizer, it started as like a tongue in cheek kind of thing, right? Because, you know, we're, we're taking this European cassette contraption and we're going to, we're going to Americanize it, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and so that's kind of, but then it stuck, you know, I actually, it, it was kind of a joke and then it, it has nothing to do with like, it's not a political statement or anything like that. You know, it's, I just thought it was kind of funny that we were Americanizing this European poo machine and I printed the the very first couple of prototypes i had actually had the name on there and then i actually looked it up and it was not trademarked or uh-huh. anything like that so 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 it is now but uh yeah that's why we went with americanizer it's because it americanizes the process of dumping a european kind of cassette so i i just wanted to back up a second because you said you printed it at home i'm assuming you have your own 3d printer that you were able to print this at your house your first the first one was printed at your at home yeah, yeah. This is this is absolutely in every sense of the word a, a small business sort of story, right? Um, you know, the Fit RV has has two employees, James and Steph, and that's it, right? It started off so at first I I looked for probably like two years because I thought, well, surely someone makes an adapter for for getting because no one wants to be exposed to a gusher of sewage. You know, surely there's an adapter for this. And for two years, I looked and there's not one. There's well, there is now, but there was not one. I was just incredulous about that. And then about the time the Winnebago Echo came out and Winnebago had made the decision to put a cassette toilet in that, you know, that we, we kind of decided that was going to be our next RV. And then it became a much more personal sort of project for me. It's like, all right, I got to figure out something <laughs> for this because that's just kind of, ew, you know? And so, yeah, started off by searching for products, couldn't find one. And then, yeah, I, this was kind of a, it was kind of a COVID project for me. Mm. I had to learn 3D printing. I figured that's how I would try to make the first one is is just try to 3D print it. So I had to learn 3D printing, which I did not know before. And then if I didn't want to be limited to just 3D printing designs that other people had made, of which there wasn't one for this, then I also had to learn CAD and product design in CAD. Now I had had drafting classes, but, and I'm dating myself here, but when I went to engineering school, I drafted with a pencil and paper. (laughs) So to have to do this with CAD was, was yet something else I had to learn, you know, but it was COVID. I had plenty of time on my hands, you know, so I bought a 3d printer, not knowing how to use it and then figured that out. And then I got into fusion 360 and was able to, you know, at the end of the day, it's all math and that I do understand. And so Get into Fusion 360 and was able to design the product and then print it at home on a 3D printer. It took me a while to get it right. You know, I had some earlier ones that just didn't quite fit, you know, because you can specify a dimension of something. And then when you print it out, depending on your printer settings and the kind of material you use, it might wind up, you know, a few microns bigger this way or there's some shrinkage there. And so, it, you know, it took a little bit, but I got it dialed in. And yeah, I actually literally printed the the first ones out in in my shop. And you can actually see that first one. It's in like a video that we made about it. And that was that was sort of the first way we got into this is I made a I mean we had a, a YouTube audience already that was primarily of of small, you know, RVers, like not small not small people, but people who like small <laughs> RVs. <laughs> I understood. <laughs> I, I should, <laughs> anyway, um, so we, we had that audience. And so I sort of made a video because, you know, I was thinking, well, maybe other people would want this. Is this an opportunity or am I just up in the night and most people don't really care? <laughs> and, you know, I made the video kind of thinking, well, I'll put this video out there showing people what this is. And then I'll just sort of ask the question, you know, like, is this something you'd be interested in? You know, because if if like, 10 people came back and said, yeah, that's a great idea, you know, then that's one thing. But when I did that, I had like 1,200 people came back and said, yeah, that's a great idea. And so I'm like, okay, maybe I should look into doing something with this. 
And so that's sort of where it took off from. But the very first one that I printed that came out 100% usable is in that video. And so, yeah, you can I still have it somewhere. If, but, if yeah, you send send me the link to that video, we'll put it in the show notes so that people can check it out, anybody that's listening. And, and also, before you get too far along, for anybody listening, so you, you had this idea, would you say your first step was learning how to make this? Or would you say the first step was making sure that there was a market for it? Uh, The first thing I had to do was to learn how to make it even for myself, because I knew, you know, after searching for a long time, I knew there wasn't anything and that if I wanted something, I was going to have to make it myself. Okay. I wanted it regardless. And I had no idea how useful a 3D printer could be. Otherwise, I don't know how anybody RVs without a 3D printer, honestly. (laughs) And I have like, I have two of them now. I just got a new 3D printer that prints out of, out of resin so I can make like waterproof parts, which is a scary thought when you think that I developed the first one without a waterproof (laughs) capable 3D printer, but but it's okay. I'm sure it'll, it'll come up. I'll explain why, but but yeah, I, I, that was the first step was, was getting the printer in and making one for myself. And then came the whole aspect of figuring out if, if it was a viable commercial opportunity. I would have made one for me regardless. Okay. Now, when you developed this, you kind of made it for your cassette toilet. I'm sure it was based on your cassette toilet. Are they all standard sizes I'm, or is there only like one manufacturer of cassette toilet or? Yeah. So that that's actually something that just sort of worked out in my favor. So hmm. cassette toilets are like worldwide. And we asked friends in Europe and the UK and whatever worldwide, they're like 90% all made by Thetford okay. and all of their cassette toilets have the same spout. If you go to order a replacement spout for your cassette toilet, there is one, regardless of, you know, they have like 30 maybe different models of cassette toilets, but they all use the exact same spout with the exact same cap. So the Mm -hmm. interface where I would have to attach to was the same across 90% of the RV market, you know, for, of cassette toilets anyway. And then, you know, we all know that on the other end, the, the standard three inch sewer hose, that's a standard, right? Anybody can plug up to that. So the fact that all the the cassettes, not all, but most of the cassettes are made by Thetford and Thetford only has one spout, that made it pretty viable to actually go ahead and and invest a little in in building something. If the market had been more fragmented, you know, if there had been like 10 players each with 10% of the market, eh, then I don't know, you know, I'd have to make a whole array of adapters, you know, to to screw into that side of the cassette toilet. So that that just worked out. I'm I'm a bit of a cassette toilet newbie. So the spout on the cassette toilet, is it threaded? Are you atta- when your Americanizer goes onto it, are you threading it on or does it slip on? Yeah. No, it's a it's a thread on thing. So imagine like um you should probably I'll I'll send you a picture or something of a cassette toilet so people can kind of see what it looks like. But there is a a spout and it's maybe I don't know, yeah, like two inches maybe or so the inner diameter you know so imagine a tube like a two like a two inch piece of pipe you okay. know and then there are threads on the end of it and then you put a cap on it and that's how you keep it like when it's in the rv you put a cap on it and the cap is is watertight and so i just attach to that same place where the where the cap would attach and then on the other end is the is the three inch or the you know the bayonet fittings for rv sewer hoses okay okay gotcha I have a question going back actually a little bit to what you were talking about earlier and the whole gray tank thing, because it's totally unrelated to your product though. And I apologize for interrupting what we were talking about, but you were saying that most of the major manufacturers, you might have a cassette toilet, but then you have a gray tank, which requires the hose and everything like that. But I'm guessing in Europe, since I've never RV'd in Europe and it seems like they might not have gray tanks. So what do they have in place of their gray tank? Oh no, they have, they have gray tanks. The way they, the way they empty them is completely different. It's kind of cool. And it, it feels weird the first time you do it. So basically imagine a big drain in the ground. That's maybe like, again, maybe like a yard square, but it's in the ground and you drive over it. Like the whole RV, you pull it over it, and then you just 
pull a lever and it's like it just dumps right onto the ground but the ground is now a drain and it's all sloped you know so that if you're not quite exactly lined up over the drain so yeah the art the there's no hose so basically you just pull it and just go out the bottom of the rv it's like a bomb oh, okay yeah <laughs> so yeah they, they empty them in a completely different way so they don't have the hose over there but then over there the, every place where you go all the rv parks you know even some cities and whatever all their dumps are set up for cassette toilets. You know, I mean, they've all got these giant nasty sinks, you know, that <laughs> you can dump in and not worry about. So you don't need to try to hit a little hole in the ground because they don't they don't use that. And you wouldn't want to just dump the cassette into where they dump the the gray water. That's I mean, it'd be like dumping it on a, you know, I don't know, on like the apron at an airport or something, right? It was just kind of weird. So they all they all have those other those other big sinks. Also, Another interesting one in Europe, and you can see this like if you go to Caravan Salon, the big RV show in Germany, someone is like, you know, taken up on the idea and they've made like a cassette cleaning machine. And so like you pay like two euro, you put your cassette in this machine and it just like inverts it, dumps it out, rinses it out, whatever, you know, and you just get an empty cassette back. It's kind of cool. We don't have anything like that here. No, well, I mean, I can't say no one in the U.S. has one, but it's certainly far from a standard. Okay, I, I've thought about you know like uh, getting one of these machines. You know, I mean, they're expensive, but they're not like end of the world expensive. You know, they're like you know fifteen thousand dollars or something. I don't know, but okay, but getting one and then taking it to like big RV rallies where I know there are going to be lots of people with a small RV, you know, and. I don't know. It would. I, I figured out it would take me kind of a long time to break even. <laughs> even two bucks a dump, right? I mean, it's, <laughs> anyway, and, and plus, then you know, you've got a even that machine then has to find you know a, a place to put its sewage, right? So it, it just didn't really seem like a good opportunity. But they do have those machines. Okay. <laughs> Going back to you know, you, you're starting out designing. You got your idea. You've, you're taking like, I guess, online classes for your cat and stuff like that. You've, you found out that there is a market for it. At what point do you trademark names or copyright anything? Is it during the production? Do you do this before you even get started? Because you know, this is the name that you like. This is what you want to use. Yeah. So it's, there's really probably two questions there. There's, there's the question like, at what point should you get patents and trademarks mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. And then there's the question, at what point did you, James, get patents? <laughs> because the answers are two, two different answers. Um, so pretty shortly after we decided, and we didn't do a Kickstarter or anything like that for any of this, right? This is all just, you know, literally just Steph and I around the kitchen tables. And I don't know, we want to spend the money to get this made kind of a thing. But as soon as we kind of had decided that there was enough of an opportunity, that is when I filed for both uh, patents, and there, there, there's two kinds of patents. Um, I filed for a design patent for the Americanizer, not a utility patent, and I can explain the difference briefly. But and then also at the same time, I've filed for a trademark. You know, once I realized the the silly name I had been using was actually available, I'm like, well, heck, I'm I'm gonna take that. And so then we filed for that. Now the trademark has already come through that came through like a year or more ago those are those are pretty fast a trademark you know that's just the name americanizer you know little tm by it or whatever right um those are pretty quick patents are much slower the, i've been making this thing and selling it now for two years or or more and i am told i am to expect the patent application to be published just any week now or the, not the application but the patent to be published any week now so it's like a couple years process to actually get a patent so uh, a utility patent would be a patent for like like a, a function and the function that the americanizer does is it, it's an adapter at the end of the day right it's it just takes the output of one plumbing system and adapts it to the input of another, right? Mm -hmm. The idea of a of a adapter for plumbing has been done to death. You know, there's no there's no way to get a utility patent on the idea of an adapter for sewage systems or anything like that. So we didn't even try for that. But now the particular way that we do it in the Americanizer, that 
was I, I actually got like a patent attorney and whatnot, and we kind of went around with this, and that actually we thought was something that was was patentable. And the biggest thing that the Americanizer does, and this is why it's patentable, and I'll see you know occasional comments like on the Amazon product page, you know, where people say, "Why is this patentable? It's just a piece of plastic," you know. <laughs> most a lot of things are just a piece of plastic, right? But your heart catheter is a piece of plastic, <laughs> but you, you want a patent on it. But the way it the way it does it is it's an adapter that the sewage technically never flows through. So imagine, so you've got like a hose, let's say you've got your RV sewer hose, which is like a big three inch hose, right? And then you've got the output of the cassette, which is a two inch tube. So imagine holding the end of the cassette, the two inch tube inside uh, of the three inch tube, mm -hmm. but not touching. And so basically the waste comes out of that two inch tube, but it's already at that point inside the three inch hose. So it doesn't actually flow through. So it's not, I mean, you don't want to put it on like your dinner table, right? <laughs> but it, it doesn't just get wildly filthy and give you one more chore to, to deal with when you're mm, dumping because it actually holds the end of the end of the cassette inside the beginning of your sewer hose. Now it's just by a few millimeters. There, there's not a lot of space available to do that, but it's enough that we're not actually flowing waste through that adapter so that's that's probably like the biggest thing because anybody could probably cobble up you know an adapter with some plumbing fittings and some hose or whatever right? yeah but that thing would be nasty by yeah. the time you used it you know this actually doesn't get nasty so was that a goal of yours right from the beginning to create something that wouldn't get i'll use your term there nasty or was that done through revisions that, that was done through revisions on on my own at first I had, you know, like my first design had like the RV hose on one end of thing and then the cassette on the other end and then like space in between. Mm -hmm. And then I thought, well, let's shrink the space. And then I thought, well, why can't I shrink it, you know, make it go in the negative direction? Right. And that was like, it took me like three or four revisions to actually have that particular idea. Okay. okay. And that was, it, it started off as me just trying to make it smaller and take less material. And then after I did that, that was cool. Then I started adding material back. <laughs> so if you look at it, the, a lot of people, when they first get the Americanizer and they look at it, they feel like it's going on the wrong way mm. because they're thinking of an adapter in the typical sense. And they want to screw on this, this thing on this end and this thing on the other end. But it doesn't work that way. It goes on what feels like backwards the first time you put it onto your cassette. Part of that, I mean, that's intentional because I made the thing bigger and I put all these knobs on it because I figure people are going to be doing this with gloves, you know, or it's cold out or whatever, right? And so I wanted just this big, easy. I made Steph put the thing on with while wearing a pair of oven mitts, you know, to make sure that she could actually get it on wearing oven mitts. And she's left-handed, you know, and whatever, right? So she was able to do that. And then I said, all right, well, that's pretty easy. I think probably most people could manage that because I didn't want to create like a fine motor dexterity issue for people, you know, cause like it can be wet or cold or whatever. That's the other thing that it does. That's, that's pretty cool is, is it, it's really easy to, to do once you wrap your head around the fact that it goes on what looks like backwards. So I am hearing that this is more than just a piece of plastic. <laughs> that's what I'm getting out of this, that there is a lot of thought. I mean, you're going through revisions. You're thinking about the ease of use. Yeah. So definitely more than a piece of plastic. So when you do file that patent, you said it takes almost two years, maybe more. While that patent is being pending, I'll use the word. I'm not sure if that would be the right word. Can other people kind of steal your idea while it's being? Yeah. Um, so people could, they wouldn't have much success because our patent is, is on record as having been filed, you know, back to two years ago now. And so if we are granted a patent for this design, then any others which come after will be, will be invalidated because we have a patent for, you know, we had the first idea, obviously. Gotcha. Something unfortunate that's happened is, um, is now that we are seeing actually like Chinese knockoffs appear. Oh. So someone... From China has uh, scanned in my my part, made their own 3D model, copying it as exactly as they could, and they're trying to sell the same thing for less. The unfortunate thing is I can't do anything about that until my patent is published, uh, because you know I can't 
have them taken off of eBay or whatever. Once I once I have a patent, I can, you know, if I can prove that they that they infringe on my design patent. But until that's published, I can't really do anything about it because, you know, eBay, Amazon, whoever, they don't know, you know, they're not going to put themselves in the position of being arbiter of my patent dispute. But once I have a patent, then it's it's it'll be pretty obvious. So you make a product, um, you revise it, you're happy with the design finally. I think you said you made a YouTube video where you kind of, quote unquote, released it to the public and asked if there was any interest in it. You saw that interest. You obviously can't manufacture at any sort of scale with your 3D printer in your workshop. So what's the next step for you? At first, I looked at there are like, you know, 3D printer farms, you know, where you can send them a design and have them print out just, you know, hundreds of copies of your your design, right? I looked at that. That was kind of not really going to be, I mean, it'd be fine for like a small run for friends or something, you know, but for something to sell and knowing how much people are, you know, willing to spend on on sewage accessories, you know, I mean... It just wasn't going to be practical. So then I had to look for ways to get the cost down, like way down. And, you know, because at the end of it, it's a pretty big, well, it's not big, but it's like four inches by four inches by four inches. It's, it's round and four inches tall. So I had to look for ways to get that down. So, you know, the, the cheapest way to do it when you get to like real volumes is injection molding. And so the ones that you buy today that you can get on Amazon, those are injection molded. Um, I started by going to, you know, local facilities here. Uh, we're in Utah. I started, you know, by going to a couple facilities here and, you know, kind of getting bids, you know, and they, you know, they want the same kind of input file, you know, your, your CAD drawings and whatnot that the 3D printers want or whatever. So that was pretty easy. But even that was going to be like pretty darn expensive. Per part was going to be expensive, but then even the the startup cost was going to be considerable because the way the way it works is to get something injection molded, you have to pay someone to make a mold. And the mold, I mean, technically it's something you own, but you know, it's only going to work on the machine, the injection molding machine at this particular factory or whatever, right? But you technically it's yours. You you buy the mold, but it's a very precision machined thing, you know, a hunk of steel, whatever, right? And there may be multiple parts, you know, if you've, and the Americanizer has internal threads, so it's a multi-piece mold because it has to like separate and shrink and whatever, you know, so they can mold the inside as well as the outside. Hmm. So you have, you have to pay for that mold. And that was going to be like a lot of money here. And so that was, it was, and so then I just started looking online is, is what I did. And I found places and and this is this is where people get annoyed with the name americanizer because it's actually made in china but the difference in in cost and the difference in turnaround time like when it could get on their schedule to get a mold made and have first parts made it was astounding i mean like like 20 percent of the cost to have them made in china and and you know i was looking at things that were maybe like a year sooner getting it done. I wasn't, wasn't super thrilled about it, but it is what it is. You know, there's, there's no fight in it. So yeah, we had, and the way I did it is I found some place that has a, a factory that has a U.S. presence. So there were U.S. based engineers and whatnot mm-hmm. that I could talk to and, and work with. And then they just, they take care of interfacing with the people on the fa- in the factory in China and getting the scheduling done, whatever. And they, they have like a web portal and they keep me posted on what's going on with, you know, having things where, where we are in the schedule and that sort of thing. So it's, it's made in China, but there is, there are, the people that I deal with are here in the U.S. I'm actually surprised that you did not learn Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, sorry. <laughs> uh, that's, a, that's a bridge too far. Okay. But, uh, you have your limits. You know, so, but it's, you know, there's good and bad to going to, to China, right? The good is, is, yeah, the parts are available at a much lower cost and a much quicker time that I could ever get them done here. Um, you know, the downside is that some of these Chinese 
knockoffs that I'm starting to see now. If you actually look up like, you know, the fake companies where they're, you know, listed under whatever, they're like three blocks away from the factory in China where my part is actually made, you know, things that make you go hmm, kind of a thing. So I, I, good I, and bad. I wonder yeah. if that would have happened either way, though, James. Maybe it happened a little sooner, but yeah, I, I think eventually that would have happened but no matter which. I, which I am by no means unique in having some, you know, in having Chinese knockoffs made of my product. <laughs> right? It's just my my product is was a very good one to do for a like first venture into designing and making a product because there's just one piece, one part. There's no fitment issues. There's no, I mean, there's, there's no gasket seals, nothing. It's just one plastic thing. There's nothing to break. There's no servicing. There's, it's very simple. It's, and so it was a really good one to do, you know, for someone just learning how to, you know, do offshore manufacturing and product design and, and what have you, you know, unfortunately those same things also make it very easy to copy. Yeah. What, what about quality then? Because it is, I don't want to say it's a simple design because it really isn't after you break down everything that it took, but there are no moving parts and things like that. So is quality control, do you feel is easy or easier than it could, than, than, than it would be for other items? Yeah. Although, you know, I, I, manufacturing in China and, and, you know, I, I want to like hate on them, you know, because America, you know, but, but it's, they've actually gotten to be quite good. And, and, you know, we've had no quality issues with the parts that, that we've had made. And, you know, most things that you get nowadays are probably made in China anyway. I don't have any quality concerns. Even if I were to make something that was a bit more complicated, you know, as long as you, you go through the process and you don't make any shortcuts in the process. So the way it worked is I sent them the files, you know, and then they went to work at making a mold over in China. I've never seen the mold, never seen the factory. And so then to make sure that the mold worked, I sent them like shipped over to them in China, um, the mating parts, like the, the, you know, the cassette spout and an RV fitting and whatever for them to make sure that, you know, when they come off the mold, it needs to screw onto this and it needs to fit onto this, you know, and I sent that to them. And so then they made some adjustments and there were some adjustments they made to the product design. We'll call it design for manufacturing. You know, there are some constraints when you when you make something with an injection molding machine that, you know, you have to have like draft angles. You know, if you have if you have a tube that's the same diameter and like six inches long, you have to have a little bit of an angle on that tube or they'll never get the mold out. You know, it has to get easier as it things have to taper. Um, so there was a little bit of that they had to do. And for allowing them ways to put the mold on and off the product, I had to make a few little changes like that. But then once I got that working, then I sent them the mating parts. They took a couple, you know, made a couple and then showed me, you know, sent me a video saying, look, we made the mating parts. Once I gave them the thumbs up, then they're like, all right, well, let's make a short run of just five of these. We'll send them to you. You test them out. And so what I did, since I had made that video, I just asked for volunteers of the people who had chimed up that like, yeah, this looks like a good product. Because I wanted like a variety of, of different types of cassettes and I want, you know, different use cases, you know, somebody up north, somebody down south, yada, yada, yada. And so I picked five volunteers. I sent them like, hey, these are prototypes. You know, if you get dirty, I, <laughs> <laughs> you know what you're signing up for. You know? <laughs> and then they and the, the feedback came back and was like, no, this is this looks like it's good to go. You know, thank you very much. I had one guy that was like a plumber using it on a like a porta potty in his plumbing van, you know, and then some regular RVers. And yeah, I, I sent one to uh, Lixen RV in Forest City, Iowa. He said, Hey, if you know, if you wouldn't mind trying this out. And so when they'd had someone that came in with like a cassette issue or something, they want to dump the cassette, they would use that to try it. That's a great idea. And so, yeah. So we ran through a little like beta test, I guess you'd call it. And uh, when those came back, I, you know, I green lighted it and said, all right, let's let's make a couple thousand of these things. And and they did. As long as you go through those steps, you know, and, and, and you respect the process. Everybody seemed to be focused on on getting a quality product out. So no real concerns there. 
And then when it came time for the actual selling, how are you getting your distribution done? How are, how are you getting it into the hands of the consumer? Where, where can they purchase it? How does it get shipped out to them? You know, we're, we're RVers as well, right? And so, like I said back at the beginning, you know, somebody waiting around for eight weeks while we're out on an RV trip somewhere up to Glacier National Park or something, waiting for eight weeks for me to ship you an Americanizer, we realized very, very early on that that just wasn't a model we could even think about pursuing. Um, so I, I knew I was going to need like a, a fulfillment partner, a fulfillment house to actually ship the orders. And so there are a couple local ones here. And that was another kind of surprise, I guess, is that I went to some local ones. I said, here's the product, you know, what is it going to cost? Let's say I build a, you know, Shopify app or something to send you the orders. You download them each day. You ship this out. What's it good? And it, unfortunately, nobody beat Amazon, FBA, fulfillment by Amazon. It was Nobody got as good as that. And then considering that I could list the product on Amazon and it's just like one, a one-stop thing, right? So for, for us now, um, the product is listed on Amazon. And if you buy it, it is fulfilled by, you can get a prime two-day shipping or even same-day delivery in some places, right? Not that I think anyone, well, I guess if your cassette's full, maybe you do need same-day <laughs> delivery. I don't know. But, um, <laughs> But yeah, you can so you get all the benefits of their their prime delivery and discounts on shipping like no one else in the world can get, right? Like discounts on even so even sending things to Amazon, we get their discounts, you know, on our UPS shipments. I just sent some off today to go to Amazon. And then Amazon takes care of the way it works is we get a bunch and if you were to look in my garage right now, you'd see, you know, a couple thousand americanizers in boxes stacked up on a wall. We order them from China, they literally come over on a slow boat from China. <laughs> um and then they get through customs whatever, they get loaded onto trucks and then eventually, you know, I'll get a call from a freight driver and then they they bring you know, a pallet of these things into my backyard. And uh, so then we just kind of store them in the garage until it's time to ship them to Amazon. Everyone that you can buy on Amazon has made a trip across our dining room table. <laughs> so <laughs> literally every single one. We open the boxes, we put on all the appropriate Amazon labeling and, and you know, the ASIN numbers, all that sort of stuff. Repackage them and then send those boxes to Amazon. And then Amazon takes care of, all right, well, we should put, you know, we send them to one place like to Las Vegas or something. And then Amazon takes care of, all right, well, we need to move some of these to our warehouse in Ocala, Florida. We need to move some of these to our warehouse in Hershey, Pennsylvania, you know, whatever, right? They do all that. And then people just order them and they, and they ship and we don't have to deal with it. It works great for us because we're able to continue on in our RVing lifestyle uninterrupted. The only thing I have to really do is to make sure that for however long we anticipate being gone for is that Amazon has enough stock on hand to be able to fulfill the orders that might come in in that time. And that's more during the summer, a lot less. It's not a very popular Christmas item, <laughs> if you can imagine that. Um, so, but it's more in the summer, less in the winter. And so we just got to make sure they have enough on hand to be able to do that. And then we can continue on with our life as normal and just every, you know, in the winter, it's every couple of months. In the summer, it's every few weeks. We send another batch to Amazon. We could send a lot more to Amazon, but you know, if you start storing too many of them in Amazon's warehouses, they charge you for that storage space. And so it's like a balance of keeping enough there that they can fulfill all the orders, but not so many that they get sick of seeing this pile of things laying around and charge you money for storage. So, okay. But yeah, everyone that everyone that anyone has ever purchased from Amazon has made a trip across our kitchen table. So you're actually more hands-on with the product itself than I would have guessed. I would have thought maybe it wouldn't need to make the stop at your place, that it could just go straight to Amazon and then they handle distribution. So that's interesting to hear. Yeah, so we have, we, we've tried to push as much of the, uh, as much of that as we could to our factory in China. And they've been pretty, pretty accommodating. Um, so like the, uh, the screen printing of the logo and the name on the, on the product, they do that at the factory. Okay. They also put it in the appropriate package, like the, 
you know, the little bag to say, warning, don't give this bag to your baby. You know, children can choke on the bag, whatever. That bag, they put it, we got them some of those bags. Once they knew what bag to use, they're fine to put it in that bag. And then they send them like that to us. Uh, What we do, A, we just check each one to make sure there's no glitch in manufacturing of it, like that it's not missing a lug or something like that, right? And we've never had a defective one. And we make sure the bags are sealed. And then I actually put a secondary seal on the bag because I don't want something popping out and rolling around on the floor in the Amazon warehouse. And then we put a label on there, an Amazon specific barcode. We didn't, I specifically didn't have the factory do that because if you change the listing or if I wanted to list it in a different way or in a different country or something, I might have to have a new barcode. And I wanted to be able to change that on the fly myself versus having that all pre-programmed. And we don't... I mean, we're selling enough of them, but we're not selling so many that I need to have like semis going from the the port in Los Angeles to the Amazon. It's not like that. You know, it's like I'll send like, you know, 100 every few weeks kind of a thing. Still a lot, though. Okay. Instead of selling it yourself, did you ever consider licensing it to someone like Thetford that already has the the other parts and accessories? Yeah, I kind of I kind of did. So right now you can buy them from Amazon or they're like two or three RV dealers around the country that have approached and asked and it's like, all right, well, and I don't get as much money back that way from doing the wholesale thing as we do from just direct to Amazon. But like, you know, there's uh, Lixin in Forest City and I think Colonial up in New Jersey and I think there's one in Louisiana somewhere I forget their I forget their name they're the most recent one but I haven't pursued that as is a channel just if if someone asks and they're cool you know I'm like all right fine you can sell them you know that's fine but when I very first had the idea I tried to approach Thetford and I just got crickets so I'm like all right they're they're not interested here I go so yeah I've I've not Pick that back up. I thought about it originally, but now that I've already got the mold, I mean that's that's the biggest expense, and it's a considerable expense to have that mold made. But now that we've already got it, there's little need in me going somewhere else, right? Just now, it's it's just a per unit cost kind of thing. What about James? You going to a show yourself and setting up a booth at, say, the Hershey Show? Would would you ever think of that? Would you send? Maybe not James. Would you send somebody else <laughs> to maybe <laughs> sell it at the show? If you, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I've thought I've thought about that because sometimes we'll be going to a show and I'm like, well, should we just throw some Americanizers in the back and maybe, maybe take them along? You know, but you know, a couple things. It's not it's not a a general interest RVing product. Okay, so like. By far, the majority of RVers who have a traditional RV black tank would have no interest or need in ever looking at the Americanizer. It's only the only kind of show where it might make sense to go to and do that at a show would be something like Overland Expo. Definitely. Okay, where it's a lot more of the Overlander type, a lot more people who would have a cassette toilet than at a general purpose RV show. And that's the same reason why we've done yeah, literally like zero advertising mm. or I mean, literally zero. There's the original video that I made. And this is something Steph gets on me about all the time. It's like, <laughs> you need to make a product video about this thing, even if it's just for the product page on Amazon. Right. Um, but we've done none. Um, it's all been word of mouth and people who have seen it. And, you know, but the people who or looking for something like this, all you have to do is search cassette adapter. You know, I mean, if that's something you think you want, it's the first thing that comes up, right? So, and no matter how much I might advertise it to a general RVer, unless they have a cassette toilet, there is like a 0% chance they're ever going to purchase it. So we've just not spent anything on advertising because it just, it just hasn't seemed to make sense. The future of cassette toilets. Winnebago is putting the cassette toilet in the Echo, which is a considerably much larger vehicle than what a cassette toilet would normally go in. Do you see the cassette toilet making its way into other large vehicles? You know, maybe maybe a Navion or a View or those style RVs, or do you think they're going to stick with that traditional black tank? 
for the foreseeable future, I see them staying with the with the traditional black tank. And the reason being is that it's sometimes inconvenient to have to find it because I mean, think a five gallon tank, you're emptying that kind of like every day, every other day, maybe, right? I mean, a five gallon black tank, if that's it, you're emptying it quite a lot. And by the time you get into like a larger RV, you're, you're, you're thinking a lot of convenience features, right? And having to deal with your poo every day is not exactly convenient. So in Europe, yeah, it's actually the cassette toilets are in even bigger RVs than, than what we have. You could find a cassette toilet in class A in Europe, right? But the infrastructure is there in Europe for them to have easy and convenient ways to dump those cassettes. You know, all the campgrounds have the big square yard sinks to dump them into. So it's not as inconvenient over there to do that. But here, until the until we have more places to dump cassettes, they're going to stay, I won't say a niche product, because Winnebago is putting them in more and more rigs, because they do have advantages. You know, they don't freeze. They don't, they don't require a big black tank. You don't have to dump them in certain places. But it's going to be more of the smaller RVs where people prioritize sort of, of function and utility over convenience. So the Echo, yeah, overlanding rigs, yeah, Class Bs, yeah. But even that, you know, there are some people in Class Bs and even the even the Echo, a number of people have said, you know, I'm never getting an Echo because it's got a cassette toilet. I don't want to deal with that. You know, they haven't tried it yet. You know, they don't know. But there's there's that strong perception that it's kind of a pain in the butt. And, and I mean, I guess if you had like a shoulder problem, you know, and lifting because a five gallon cassette that's something else to consider right five gallon cassette full of stuff that's over 40 pounds you know if you had shoulder surgery or something that might be kind of tough to manage wrestling out of the side of your rv so i don't see it supplanting regular rv toilets but it, it does have a place and and that place is with with more mobile kind of rvs and i was going to mention that for anybody listening that maybe is thinking well why don't they just make larger cassette toilets it, it's a weight issue once you get over five pounds the weight would be just too much for you to kind of handle to pull it out of the side of a rig and then even with wheels it'd it just be too too cumbersome but you do have that added flexibility one thing people do is they'll get a second cassette if they're really thinking that i'm going someplace and i'm there's just absolutely not going to be any place to dump they'll get a second cassette and i have a second cassette I've never brought it with us on an RV trip because I've only ever put water in it because I still occasionally test things out and whatever, and I don't want to have to do that with a dirty cassette. So, you know, I have one in the shop that I use for testing and tinkering, but I could bring it along if I wanted like, you know, a 10 gallon black tank, right? I mean, that is available. You just, it's multiple smaller cassettes if you wanted that capacity. So... You've made your first product. I have a two-part question. The first part is, what advice would you give to somebody that was had an idea like you had and wanted to get started? And the second part of the question is, um, because you mentioned earlier that you got a second 3D printer, are you working on anything else that you're planning on? I, I, I wasn't going to talk about that last part, but maybe. Um, so uh, the first part of your question is uh, if someone else had an idea, what, what advice would I give? I guess the first thing I would say is maybe keep it simple. The less complications your product has, the easier it's going to be to get it made, to get people to understand what it is, how it works. And, and, you know, and that is true for both customers and for people that might, man, might manufacture it for you. The simpler it is, the easier it's going to be. It'll also be easier if you decide to. And that's the, that's the other piece of advice, I guess, would be to file for patent protections as early as you possibly can. At least, you know, if you want to consult with a patent attorney and whatnot. There was enough for me to figure out. I didn't want to also figure out the legal process around applying for a patent as well. I had enough to learn with learning 3D printing and CAD and whatever, right? There's some expense in applying for the patents and trademarks, especially if you if you hire that out like I did. But to start that as early as is practical, and you kind of have to decide how early that is because you don't just go filing for a patent on a whim because there's there's some cost to that. But do that as early as you can because the lead times are enormous 
And because you're dealing with the government, I suppose. So, you know, really long lead times and you want that to come in just as, as soon as possible. Take your IP and intellectual property aspects seriously. As soon as you're certain that you're going to try to make a go of it, I would, I would file for that because it's, it's worth it in the long run. So take your IP seriously. Uh, keep it simple. And I guess the third piece of advice would be you, you start something like this and you might think, you know, I want to make it in America and, and I don't want to sell with like Walmart and Amazon. I want to let's, let's keep it small business, you know, but the, the factories in China, you know, they're maybe don't don't fight that so much. Yes, investigate whether or not you can you can, you know, use non mega retail outlets and investigate whether you can have it made here. Do your due diligence. But. Don't fight it too hard because there's a reason why people have everything made in China. And the reason is, I mean, it, the, the, the cost difference is staggering. So that's, that's certainly one of is don't fight that too much, you know, and I tried, I wanted to like, you know, maybe have, give the business to a local firm here, you know, in our town to do the fulfillment from it, you know, but it was going to cost me twice as much as fulfillment by Amazon. And so, you know, you should investigate that, but don't push the issue. I mean, the, the reason people do things this way with Amazon and factories offshore and whatnot is because there are reasons and you'll find them out. And so just don't fight it too hard. I guess those, those would be three pieces of advice. I would also think, James, that you know, bot bottom line would be also that it is going to increase the cost of that product to the consumer to a point that maybe people wouldn't consider even purchasing it at, at a, at a certain price point. Yeah, no, it, it, that's absolutely true. You know, so in addition to startup costs, you know, and, and even just for something just as small and simple as the Americanizer, the startup costs were thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars because there's, there's making the mold. There's all this IP work with the attorneys for trademarks, patents, whatever. There's, you know, just even shipping them to Amazon. There's a cost to all of that. And, you know, if you were going locally, then, you know, they, some places wanted me to like buy boxes and I had to commit to certain minimums and, you know, it all adds up at some point in there, you got to not only just break even, but you got to make some money back and all those things. Yeah. It all adds up. Maybe I could have tried a little harder, but I even had someone contact me who was the, he worked for the chamber of commerce in like some town in Ohio that had like three or four injection molded factories there in his town. And he's like, you know, I'd like a shot. It'd be, it, you know, taking this and, and let's see if we can get this made here in America. And I'm like, excellent. Here are the files. Take these, take these out to your factories and let them bid. These are the kinds of quantities we're talking about. You know, it's not small batch, but it's not mega millions of things either. Right. He came back after a couple of weeks. Like none, none of my guys would even would even look at it. Their advice to me was to send you to China. And that's them telling their chamber of commerce director guy to send the, don't, we don't even want to take a bid on it. We're, we're just going to send him to China. So it all adds up and, and yeah, there's, there's cost to all of it. Now, the second part of your, of your question about my, uh, my, my new 3d printer. So the first, the first 3d printer I had was like what they call an FDM printer. It kind of prints out a little string of goo and there's a print head that traces the part, you know, and it builds layer by layer kind of thing. That's great, but there's a lot of little layers, you know, and, and it's not known for being watertight exactly. Water can get through it. And so for the Americanizer, it doesn't matter so much because remember, stuff doesn't actually flow through the Americanizer. So it was okay for a prototype for that. The new printer I have is a, a sort of a large-ish uh, resin printer. And basically that, that makes prints by solidifying layers of resin with UV light. And since it's like resin, I mean, it's like epoxy. It's not that thick, but, you know, think epoxy, right? And it, it chemically bonds to the layers above and below. And so it, it makes things that can be much more watertight. So I do have an idea. I'm not ready to share what that is yet. I do have an idea. Well, and I haven't applied for any sort of patent or anything <laughs> like that yet. But I do have an idea for something. It is also something for the cassette toilet because they're only getting more popular and and they've been largely overlooked and this one the, the cool thing about cassettes is if you can make a product for the cassette toilet yeah there are some people here that might want it right but there's like 15 million people in europe that might want it 
you know, there's a few here, but really for a cassette product, the, the big market is is Europe because that's and even New Zealand, Australia, whatever. They all use the cassettes. Everybody but us in North America. I'm not ready to share what that is yet, but it is a product geared for the cassette toilets, and it's it's something to make them let's just say more pleasant. There 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 are challenges to having just five gallons for black tank and that being inside your RV kind of and whatever. So but I'll I'll leave it at that. But I got I got the uh the new 3D printer because for this one I really wanted my prototype parts to be waterproof if I'm going to be sending it to friends or whatever and say, "Hey, try testing this." I don't want to have create a situation where they're no longer my friends so you know <laughs> but yeah there i am working on something else so it wasn't too scary of a process for you if you're gonna have another go at it no the big the big disappointment has been has been the knockoffs you know lately and that's only come up in the last few months and the way I the way I first noticed it because you know once I've got this all set up I don't go shopping for americanizers on a daily basis right you know I I check my inventory levels is about really mostly what I do to determine when to replenish but I noticed at some point that our sales kind of just fell off a cliff and I'm like what the heck happened and uh, and that's when I found that there were there were these knockoff products I guess what I would say is when when you see like a knockoff product and you might think, oh, it doesn't hurt anyone, you know, it's just they're just making it cheaper or whatever, right? You know, or it's it's a it's a fake Fendi bag, but so what? You know, it's 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 Fendi; they can afford it, kind of thing. But at some point, there's real people behind it. Like, think of me sitting at my kitchen table, <laughs> right? And then like you know, some sleazy factory, you know, somewhere else making knockoffs of this thing that it took me like a month to figure out, you know, of all my nights and weekends and then try and say, there's people behind that at some point. And so, you know, I would just encourage and not just for the Americanizer, but for anything where you see there's like just a deliberate knockoff that's like not really there. Think before you before you patronize something like that, because like I said, there's there's people behind it at some point. And in the case of the American, I said that people is Steph and I and on our dining room table. So, well, James, I believe that's all of our questions. But before we let you go, is there anything we missed that you want to add to the conversation? No, I think we pretty much covered it all. Um, you know, if people want an Americanizer, <laughs> they're available on Amazon. And uh, yeah, no, I guess that's about it. OK, great. Thanks so much for taking the time to talk with us today. It was great to have James join us today to not only talk about what it takes to get a company started, but I think he also really educated us on the cassette toilet and some of the differences of RVing here in the United States compared to Europe. I love episodes like this that really take us from an idea to a product, and we hope you found this information helpful and can appreciate all the work that goes into bringing a new product to the RV industry. Take care all, but before we go, could you take the time to leave us a rating or review on your favorite podcast platform? These ratings really help us get ranked and reach a larger audience. As always, thanks to our sponsors, Battleborn Batteries and Wholesale Warranties for this episode. Safe travels, and we will catch you next time. Looking to get out there and stay out there? Battleborn Batteries Lithium-Ion Batteries are here to power your RV, marine, and off-grid adventures. Designed as an easy drop-in replacement for traditional lead-acid batteries, these reliable solutions have two to three times the power, charge five times faster, are a fifth of the weight, and last 10 times longer. Offered in a variety of models in unique sizes and shapes, ranging from 50 amp hour to a robust 270 amp hour, and backed by a 10-year warranty. Battleborn batteries are built to fit your needs and power your experiences. On the road, on the water, and off the grid, reliable power is here. Check them out at BattlebornBatteries.com. With the complexity of all the systems in an RV, I always say it's not if something's going to break, but a matter of when is something going to break. That is why I think an extended warranty for RVs is so important. We first interviewed wholesale warranties back in 2019 and immediately became impressed with how their policies worked, such as, you can take your RV to any licensed repair shop, including mobile repairs. They also have personalized service plans, making sure you are getting the right policy for your needs. And if you think your RV is too old for a policy, you might be surprised to hear that RVs up to 20 years old can still be approved for a policy. That is more age lenient 
than most RV parks I've stayed at. Go to wholesalewarranties.com forward slash beyond the wheel or click the link down below in our show notes to get your free quote today.